Right, so this is from June 2016, question 1.5 dealing with meiosis. If you look at a question paper for life sciences generally, question one has shorter questions, right? 1.1 multiple choice, 1.2 will be uh, those multiple matchings, A only, B only, both none. 1.3, no, sorry, 1.2 would be terminology, 1.3 would be that multiple matching. And then 1.4, 1.5 are these smaller questions, normally there are quite short answers there. Uh, if you look at this question, diagram below shows a cell in two different phases of meiosis. So there's two different phases that I've shown you, even though there's three cells that are represented. We said when you have something with diagrams, you always label the diagram first, right? So structure A would represent what? A wouldn't be a bivalent, right? I'm... A is the centriole, good, All right? So structure, I'm not answering the question still, I'm asking you what is structure A? Structure A is a centriole, okay? And structure B, the nuclear membrane, that's correct, right? So you can see there's two circles there, right? So you have to be careful what those two circles, right? Uh, that the outer circle would be what? Who can tell us what's the outer circle? Which is the cell membrane, very good, right? So uh, we have to be careful when we're labeling these specific diagrams, okay? There's the, normally if you look at a cell like those on the right hand side, what you see there is the cell membrane. There's no nuclear membrane. Because if you understand your phases of meiosis, after interphase, when you move to prophase, we find that the nuclear membrane disappears. Okay. And then only during uh, telophase does it reappear again. Okay. So you'll only find two circles when you're looking at uh, the phase of prophase generally or telophase, when you're going to get there's two parts to it, the outer part, which would be the cell membrane, and the inner part, which is the nuclear membrane. Part C would represent what then? Very good, right? A homologous pair of chromosomes. I, I wouldn't just say homologous pair. Homologous pair of what? Because homologous means the same size, right? And then pair means two of them, same size, same shape, same uh, position of the centromere and the same genes that they carry. And then pair means two of them. But of what homologous pair of chromosomes is the best way to answer that, right? Here you can say bivalent, but I avoid that because don't use that because only in this case where crossing over is happening will it be called bivalence. Otherwise, if there's a space between them, it's still homologous chromosomes, but not called bivalent. And that's why I don't teach uh, bivalent, if you notice, in when we did it in class, right? So just stick to homologous chromosomes there. Structure D is what? It's just a chromosome, good carabot over, right? That's just a chromosome. And then if we look at the, the phases, they're going to ask you that the next question. Uh, even if they don't ask you, you try and label all of the phases. It makes it easier for you to understand what's happening later. Diagram one represents. Prophase one, correct, All right? So if you look at diagram one, we can see what gives us the clue that it's prophase one. Okay, one is the fact that you see homologous chromosomes is telling you that it has to be in the first stage. Only in prophase one, metaphase one are the two phases that we, we have homologous pairing. Okay, so that already tells you it's in the first stage of meiosis. Uh, then the other clue that it's prophase is that we can see that there's crossing over occurring. And crossing over only occurs during prophase one, right? Uh, then if we look at diagram two, which phase is that? Metaphase two, good. Many of you all got that correct, right? So that's metaphase two. 
And how do we know it's metaphase M for meta, M for middle, right? The chromosomes are arranged in the center at the equator. So that tells you it's metaphase. And also the, the fact that we, how we know it's the second stage is that because the chromosomes are arranged singly and not in homologous pairs. In metaphase one, they are arranged in homologous pairs, but here we find that they are arranged singly, which means that they are now in the second division, right? Which is in what we call a metaphase two, right? Good. Uh, then, so we've already answered 1.5.1, right? Diagram one, we've got that. Uh, and which we said was prophase one. Diagram two, we said it's metaphase two. Provide labels for A, B, and C. We've done that already. We said A is the centriole. You wouldn't say centrosome. Centrosome would be before when these two structures, this one here at the bottom and this one on the top, when they are together, that's when we call it the centrosome. And once it starts separating, it's called a centriole. Okay, and then we said B was the nuclear membrane and we said C was a homologous pair of chromosomes. But give the functions of part label A and D. Part label A, the centriole function, Right, it forms the spindle fibers, good. As it separates and it moves towards the poles, it forms spindle fibers, right. Uh, then they're saying, give the function of part D, function of a chromosome. Carries genetic materials, right, good. It, co it contains DNA. Then, are the cells in diagram two haploid or diploid? Right, haploid, good. Uh, Ahmed, it's haploid. And Iram also got it haploid, right? When you look at the process of meiosis, during anaphase one, we've got the separation of the chromosomes, half going to the one side, one pole, and the other half going to the other side. So after anaphase one, once you reach telophase one, it's already haploid. So anything after telophase one is haploid. Anything before telophase one would be diploid. So this is after telophase one. That means that it's going to be haploid. All right. And then name the process that would cause variation in the structure D. All right. That's crossing over. Good. All right. Uh, there's only two processes that result in variation, namely crossing over and random arrangement. But this is talking within this one chromosome then the only possible answer then would be crossing over. Okay, so if we look at the memorandum there, I think we've had all of the answers correct, right? Uh, homologous pair, we said bivalent, you can accept, but I, I avoid that, right? Just stick to homologous pairs, right? Uh, we, and carries genetic material or hered hereditary material. Right? So that covers the first activity, which was based on the process of meiosis. So we're looking, there was another one that we gave you. Uh, this question first had something on genetics, right? And this is on a dihybrid cross. Okay, I'm not sure if all of the classes have got to this point. And I know even as uh, we left, where we just explained it, we didn't do too many examples on it, right? Uh, when we get back, we'll have to finish up that section on genetics and then we'll move to the section on the nervous system. Right, they're saying the size and color of unripe fruit in a plant species is genetically controlled. The allele for small fruit, small b, is recessive. So small letter we know is recessive. And the allele for big fruit is a capital B. So you can see that's complete dominance, right? There's the same letter, one capital and one small. The allele for yellow fruit color, small g, is recessive to the allele for green fruit, which is a capital G. Okay, so... Already, what type of cross are we talking about here? I gave you a clue that it's dihybrid, but you can see there's two different things. There's one is there's two letters and each two different types of letters, like a B and a G, and both of them have a capital and a small. That means that now you're talking of two different traits and recessive and dominant for each one. So this is going to be a dihybrid. They're talking about the size of the fruit as well as the color of the fruit, right? So that just makes you... Uh, certain that it's a dihybrid cross. 
And then again, if you look at this genotype, you've got four letters together that already tells you that it's a dihybrid cross you're dealing with. So the first question, very straightforward, right? The phenotype of a plant with the genotype that's capital B, small b, capital G, small g, every learner should be able to get this because it's just using your same knowledge from monohybrid. If it has a capital B, which is for big fruit, and a small b for small fruit, what will be the phenotype? Right, okay, good. You've given the, the entire answer, right? Uh, but let's just start with the first part, right? If you've got a capital B for big fruit and a small b for small fruit, that's going to give you big fruit because big is dominant over small. And then you've got a capital G and a small g. And capital G is dominant, which is for green fruit. That means you're going to have green. So the phenotype for this, you'd say it's big fruit and green fruit right? Big and green fruit. So that's going to be two marks. Then state all possible genotypes of the gay meats produced by a plant mentioned in 1.4.1a. So for this plant, what are the possible gay meats, right? And I told you, how do we get the gay meats, right? Abra, you got the correct answer. They're good. Uh, but how do we get to the answer, right? The steps to, to get there. Good, we're a Punnett square, right? So I'm just gonna change what I'm sharing with you guys here, right, to a Word document there. We had capital B and small b. So you put a capital B on the one side, a small b on the other side, and we had a capital G and a small g. So you take whatever information genotype is given for that specific individual, right? So in this case, they told you that this plant was big B, small b, big G, small g, right? So that's what we had there. And uh, when we look at when we look at uh, this specific Punnett square, we're going to now fill it in. So we took the Bs, we put a capital B on one side, a small b on the other side. The G is a capital G on one side, a small g on the other side. And now we start uh, filling in here. Okay. So what do we have in the first block? It's a capital G and a capital B. And the second block, a capital G and a small b, and the third block, a small g, and a capital B, and here a small g and a small b. It doesn't make a difference if you had the b's first or the, or the g's first. Just make sure it's consistent throughout, right? Uh, if the question here started with a b, it should be actually be, be better to have the b first and then the g, but it's not going to make a difference to your answer, okay? But keep it consistent throughout whatever you're looking at. All right, so that's your answer. Capital B, capital G, capital B, small g, small b, capital G, small b, small g. Okay, so we go back to our question paper there. In a cross between two plants with genotype capital B, capital B, capital G, capital G, that's the one plant, right, which is homozygous for big fruit and homozygous for green fruit, but one that was homozygous for small fruit and for yellow fruit. What percentage of the offspring will be homozygous for both characteristics? Right, who can give us the answer there? All right, Moaz got it right, uh, zero percent, right? And it's not really difficult. You could go and make a Punnett square and you're gonna find that every K meet for this one on the left-hand side is gonna be capital B and capital G. And every K meet for this other one can only be small b and a small g because it's the only alleles it has. So if you're gonna join them up, all of your offspring, 100% of the offspring are going to get a capital B from this parent and a small b from this one and a capital G from this one and a small g from that one. So the chance of getting homozygous, it's impossible. It's a 0% chance. But it's for two marks, you had to say the units and that's something important. When you do a calculation, always have the units, right? We don't have much time. Uh, unit uh, Zoom meetings have a limit of only uh, 40 minutes when it, we're using the free feature, right? So we're going to have to just speed it up to finish up this last question, right? 1.5. The diagram below shows different phases of meiosis, right? Uh, X would represent what? OK, 
okay? We're saying X is a homologous pair of chromosomes, good. Uh, w, it's the cell membrane, right? We've uh, spoken about this just in the last question, right? To say that the inner one would have been the nuclear membrane and the outer one would be the cell membrane. And then structure Y would be what? You can see they're showing an unreplicated chromosome there where there's a circle in the center. What, what does that represent? The centromere, perfect, Iram. And then Z? Spindle fibers, Katleho is correct, right? So if you look here now at the questions, label W, W is the cell membrane, label X, X is the homologous pair of chromosomes, right? Uh, let's label the, the phases here. What is phase A? But before we even answer all of the questions, it's going to make it easier for us to answer some of the other questions there. Prophase one, correct, Iram. You can see homologous pairs of chromosomes, they're not at the center, it's not metaphase one. Can only be prophase one, right? And crossing over is shown slightly at the bottom one, right? Uh, if you look at B, what phase is that? We can see the chromosomes are moving away from each other, away from the center. That is anaphase one. Very good. Remember, you have to give a phase name and the number, right? So it's anaphase A for away from the equator, and one because we can see full chromosomes moving apart right? Replicated double-stranded chromosomes. If you look at C, what phase is C? Right, you should have done that. The last question asked you that. It's still a phase two. Perfect. Uh, and we can see four cells are formed and nuclear membrane reforms. That's obviously till a phase two. And then phase D is anaphase two. Okay, so we can see A for away, the separation happening there. But here it's not full chromosomes or double or replicated chromosomes, it's unreplicated chromosomes, right? Single stranded ones that are separating, and therefore it would be in a phase two. Okay, so we we've answered 1.5.1, 1.5.2. How many chromosomes are present in each cell in phase A? In phase A, how many chromosomes in each cell? Good, four, right? The counting exercise. One, two, three, four. And then in phase C, how many chromosomes? Two, good Iram, right? So some learners, they say, this is a chrome method and that's another chrome method when together it's only one chromosome, which is incorrect. What looks like a chrome method, we don't call it a chrome method anymore. We call it a chromosome now, an unreplicated chromosome. Uh, it's called, it's still referred to as a chromosome now because it can do the process of replication and become double-stranded, a full X-shaped chromosome again, right? So uh, it's, two chromosomes in each of those cells at the end, which is haploid. Give only the letter of the diagram that represents anaphase two. We've already answered that question, right? Which letter would, be, would that be? By labeling all of the, the, the phases in the diagram, you'd know that that would be D. Uh, then we carry on and we say that uh, give, Okay, we're done with that one there, 1.5.4. State the function of structure Y and Z. So what's the function of the centromere? We've already said that Y is the centromere. What's its function? Holds the segments of chromatids together, right? It holds the chromatids together to form a chromosome. Right, and then we need the function of structure Z, the spindle fiber. Right, uh, who's gonna say good day? I think we're just busy typing. Uh, contracts to pull chromosomes towards the ends, right? So it contracts, it pulls the chromosomes of the chromatids to the poles, good. And then identify phase C. We've already said that phase C is telophase two, right? And that brings us to the end of this activity. We'll just look at the memo quickly, right? So if we look here, Right, so for the first one, big and green, it's two marks there. If you look at that second one on the dihybrid cross, you needed to give 
all four correct to get the two marks. There's no splitting of the marks. Either you get two marks or you get nothing there. All right, so you couldn't have had maybe two of those gametes and get any marks there. Zero, one mark for the number and one mark for percent. So if you just said, the question said, what was the percentage? If you said zero, you lose one mark for not giving the unit there. All right, we said the cell membrane and the homologous chromosomes. Four, two, we had D, holds the sister chromatids together and pulls the chromosomes or chromatids to the poles. And the last answer was telophase two. Good. Okay. Uh, and that's the end of that section. Right? And next week we'll have another session looking at another set of questions.